My name is Jesse Tufts. I am a mechanical engineer. I've graduated from the U of S in 2006. I've uh, been uh, doing a variety of things for, uh, for a long time in terms of uh, different almost careers, I could say, and I've switched around. But recently I've been trying to uh, shift more towards sustainable building. I am a, currently a project engineer for Renew Engineering. So we do high performance building modeling, energy modeling, and uh, sort of deep energy retrofit consulting. Through that, I am a project manager for the Sundance Deep Energy Retrofit Project. Uh, it's a 59 unit uh, townhouse complex. I was previously a research and development engineer with all weather windows for seven years. And through that, that sort of got me in touch with uh, high performance building. And I, I spoke here a few years ago on my own house and uh, my experiences there. I was also previously on the board for Solar Alberta, uh, Solar Energy Society of Alberta. So there's a great connections there with the renewable energy industry and high performance building. They definitely go together very nicely. And I've, I've been a lifelong maker. So uh, that's a picture of me with a Japanese mini truck that I converted to electric back in 2010. So that was some of my first uh, foray into building, you know, how to, how to make your overall life as efficient as you can. So what I'm going to talk about tonight, <clears throat> I'm going to just briefly overview what is a DER, why should we be doing them, um, go over very briefly some of the projects that I have been working on. Uh, we'll look at the overall goals of a DER and then some of the lessons we've learned from the projects I've been uh, involved with. And then from those lessons, how can we optimize DERs or deep energy retrofits uh, for the future going forwards? And then sort of uh, my favorite recipe for a DER, uh, which is some, you know, something I'd like to try, I think that would work out well based on these lessons. So what is a deep energy retrofit? So for me, it's a set of comprehensive building upgrades that reduce energy and GHG use. So you know, comprehensive, so across the entire building, and we need to, we need to reduce those uh, GHGs is the most important part. So the goal of that to me, I tried to distill it to three words, is repeatable economical electrification. And I will dig into that a little bit more. So why do we need to do DERs? So we need to decarbonize. Obviously, we're glo global warming and climate change is absolutely a serious issue. It is a climate emergency. We really need to pay attention to our carbon budgets and uh, how uh, our overall emissions. So if we electrify, we can decarbonize because you can create your electricity using renewable energy. So that's a great way to get rid of the carbon from our buildings, from our transportation. So we need to electrify everything, but we need to be able to do that without breaking the grid. So how do we do that without massively scaling up our overall power generation? So with respect to carbon budgets, so it's not just we got to be net zero by 2050. We need to pay attention to how much energy we emit up until then. So we need to do this fast. We need to pay attention to embodied carbon. So this is, a, this is a new thing for builders. We can't just build everything out of styrofoam and concrete and steel. We have to start paying attention to what we're building with, as well as how we're building. And we need to build for future success. So if we can't immediately get you know, a net zero house, how can we set it up so it's going to be net zero as uh, you know, in the future, or it has the ability to get there in the future? So this is just uh, a little graph of the carbon budget for Edmonton, uh, the most recent one I could find. The dotted line on the bottom is, as far as I understand, the one and a half degree um, sort of targets based on the Paris Accords uh, for what folks should be doing. The teal line in the middle is our targets. So you know, we're, we're getting some pretty good reductions or hoping for some good reductions, but we've got a long ways to go. And the solid line on the top is our projected actual emissions. So you can see we have, we have a long ways to go. We need, a lot of, we need to do a lot of work to get our buildings uh, that are out there to uh, significantly more energy efficiency. 
Uh, so I'm just going to very briefly talk about the previous projects I've been involved with. Um, so the first one I did was uh, my own house. So I did a presentation on this a while back. Uh, first, first time in Edmonton, I think, boots on the ground. Um, and I took a 1953 semi-bungalow, added a full second story, converted it to net zero. And we've been fully net zero for the past uh, three, almost four years now. And it's been working out really good. Through that, that got me involved. Uh, so B Butterwick Construction did the build with that. And through that experience, it really sort of opened me up to what's possible. And I decided to do a career change and, and shift to working with Renew Engineering and helping Butterwick uh, projects uh, with Peter, Dave, Ann Lee, and Stuart uh, forming Butterwick projects to work on the Sundance deep energy retrofit. So this is the 59 unit townhouse complex uh, that we're currently doing a deep energy retrofit on uh, down in Riverdale. And uh, we're getting close. Uh, we should have the last set of uh, energy sprung panels up uh, in a couple weeks. Uh, also with that Sundance experience that brought on uh, three more single family home projects that we also did as panelized retrofits. And these are supported by SSREA, which is the Smart Sustainable Resilient Infrastructure Association. Um, they were very helpful in providing funding to uh, make these projects happen. And it was an opportunity for us to take this panelized process that we developed with Sundance and try it out with three different roof types. Um, so every building's different. And how do you make, you know, how can you make one one recipe work for everything you can't. So you have to be able to adapt to different situations. Um, so all of these projects, you can see case studies on them with a lot more in-depth information on the Retrofit Canada website with uh, the case study section. So looking at those projects, what did we learn from them? So the overall goals of a DER, as I was saying before, repeatable ele economical electrification. So electrification because that gives us the potential for zero emissions right now. If you electrify a building, uh, in a lot of places in Canada, the electricity is already very low carbon. In Alberta, everybody thinks, well, we've got a coal-fired grid, but it's actually getting a lot better. There's only a few coal plants left, and the last ones are set to be shut down within the next year. The grid is getting cleaner over time. So as you add renewables, that electri uh, electricity is being produced more efficiently and with less carbon emissions. And in Alberta, with a, with a private power um, retail market, you can choose to pay extra to purchase renewable energy, or you can put solar on your home and generate it directly. So economical to me means the operating costs are less than gas. Currently, there was a study with the Canadian Climate Institute that was just released that shows that heat pumps are already the most economical way to heat your home in most of Canada. And so this is just taking out your furnace and swapping in a heat pump. So this is looking at operating costs and the cost of the equipment. Uh, so this is, it's, it's amazing news. Unfortunately, Edmonton was one of the areas that they singled out as not quite being there yet, which is a little bit disappointing. But I did notice that they didn't count on taking the gas meter out uh, in terms of the overall uh, uh, study economics. So there are ways to really improve that. So how, you know, how can you, if it's already economical to operate, what are the other parts of this that make it economical? So really it's operating costs its install costs and its infrastructure. So is, can you support it with your existing electrical panel? Can your neighborhood support it? Uh, is it economical for a province to operate everyone that way? So this is where it comes into repeatable. Are your electrical loads low enough so that everyone can electrify? So could everyone on your block electrify or could everyone in your city or your province electrify? So how do we set it up so that everyone can do that? And the way to do that is by retrofitting buildings so that they're more efficient, so that those loads are lower. 
So how can you electrify with an existing 100 amp service, which is basically the standard. So from that, there are different parts of a retrofit that you can, uh, you can play with in your design to try and optimize the overall design to reduce your costs, reduce your carbon, uh, reduce your electrical load. So we're going to look at the foundation, the wall assembly, the windows, the attic, air tightness, mechanical, electrical, and construction process. So what questions should we ask? So one of the things I like to focus on is what are your inflection points for cost versus performance? So when you're you're looking at, okay, I've got one inch of insulation, two inches, three inches. At what point does that cost really start to ramp up? And can you find that point? And then can you stop there? And does that give you a good enough design? Now look at that for all of those aspects. How can you bring everything up to the, the, the best possible point and maximize your overall efficiency to cost? What kind of cost is this really? So is it maintenance? Is it Renovation or is it a retrofit? So a lot of parts of a retrofit are actually maintenance and renovation. So when I did my house, it was a full second story addition. That's definitely not part of the retrofit. That's because we needed more space as a family. Uh, we also needed new siding. That's part of maintenance and renovation. That's not really part of a retrofit. So if you split out those costs, you can break down what does this actually cost me to improve the efficiency versus needed building maintenance or, well, I just wanted granite countertops. How will all these items work together as a system? So that is very important to, to think about as we, as we continue on this. And will your trades know how to do these processes? So are you picking some really exotic process that is just not understood right now? And you know, is that going to work? How is that going to work out for you? So for each component, we want to look at how is it going to change your peak electrical load, your overall energy consumption, your embodied carbon, your operating costs, your installation costs, and your overall building resilience. So these are all uh, sort of more quantitative. Uh, the other ones were sort of qualitative questions. These are more quantitative questions you should ask. So look at the very first part, part is foundation. We'll start from the bottom. So you have an immediate inflection point. If you do it, it costs you money, no matter what. A lot of people don't insulate the foundation. But you've got a price jump if you do more than, say, 12 inches of depth. Well, you probably get 75% of your uh, initial benefit by insulating the portion that is you know, from just below grade up to the bottom of the siding. So if you can do that, that's kind of a good minimum to do. But what we did at Sundance and the SSRA projects is we hydrovacked around the foundations to be able to drop foam down uh, the, without having to use an excavator to dig. And that was a really slick way to do it. If you have to do a weeping tile, you can install your insulation for free. It's just going to be the cost of the insulation. A lot of houses in Edmonton with our clay soils, we've got leaking basements, and a lot of homes need it. I, half the houses on my block have had weeping tile replaced, and I think we were you know, not very many of them are putting on insulation. There's a real lost opportunity there. So if you have to do it, you can do it for free if you have to do weeping tile. So if you increase the insulation, it's going to reduce your peak load, your energy use, your op costs, and it's going to improve your comfort. It's a win-win-win. It will increase your embodied carbon. There's no way to put uh, foam insulation in, uh, in a house without doing that. It has a high install cost if you don't do your uh, if you're not doing weeping tile, but it will improve your resilience. It's keeping your foundation warm. Uh, it protects it from freeze thaw. So wall assemblies. This is a huge area. I'm going to have to be very brief. Um, my discussion is for exterior insulation. You can do interior, but it requires a lot of uh, disruption for your overall uh, build. So price. And complexity jumps at one inch. Above one inch, you need to use strapping. Uh, above six inch, you probably need an, basically another wall. So like something panelized, Larson truss, you need to support the side in somehow. But up to six inches, it is possible to do with strapping and long screws. So if you can time it with your siding replacement, then 
the, uh, the siding portion essentially is free. That's part of your maintenance or your renovation versus your uh, insulation upgrades. If you increase the insulation, you're obviously reducing peak loads, energy use, and op costs. You have a potential if you're using something like a panelized system with cellulose insulation or possibly uh, wood fiber insulation, which would be great to see, you could have negative embodied carbon. Most other um, materials, unfortunately, will have a high, um, higher embodied carbon. Is this a specialized install versus part of your siding? So a lot of siding contractors can put on insulation underneath. Are, are they doing it, you know, focusing on air tightness? Or is this a specialized install where we're doing something like panelization, where you need a specialized crew with training to knows how to do this? And you have to pay attention to insulation ratios, uh, moisture, you know, making sure you're not trapping, uh, trapping moisture in there. Windows. <clears throat> Price jumps are really related to cosmetics as much as performance. So if you want colored windows, your price is going to go way up. If you want, um, you know, these really nice European style uh, windows, they're going to go a lot more expensive. But there's a pretty good value argument for something like a locally made PVC triple pane window. There's a lot of them out there that have a U value under 1.0 uh, watts per meter squared Kelvin, which is about the minimum you need in terms of uh, overall performance for a high performance build. Increasing your performance of your window, you're going to reduce your loads, uh, your energy use, and your op costs. The frame choice has the biggest effect on your embodied carbon, so aluminum is really bad for that. Wood is great, but it usually, usually comes clad in aluminum. PVC and fiberglass are both lower. <coughs> The install, installation method will affect your cost a lot, but if you can figure out a way to install a window that uses a standard off-the-shelf jam and standard trim without having to do custom finishing work on the inside, you're going to be a lot further ahead in terms of reducing the complexity and the time spent inside the building. Better windows, less chance of air leakage, less chance of um, condensation and overall better resilience. The attic, so lots of opportunity here for different methods. If you have to frame out the roof, you're going to have a big price jump, but you gotta pay attention to asbestos. So if you can do it within the existing attic, you can have some great cost savings, uh, suck out the old insulation, lay down spray foam, and then blow in cellulose on top of that that we use that on the second SSRA retrofit, and that had uh, really good success for us overall. So you're gonna reduce your peak load energy use. Um, cellulose is negative embodied carbon. Uh, the newer spray foams have a fairly low GWP. It's about 20% higher than EPS insulation. So they're not as bad as they used to be. They're still not great, but there are certain areas you can use it, like in this attic ceiling that we found it works pretty well. It will reduce your operating cost to have better insulation. It will improve your resilience of the building if it's airtight, because you've got to remember uh, most of the moisture transfer within a wall or an attic is from air leakage. It's not necessarily just from vapor transfer. So if you can stop those leaks, you're making it uh, perform a lot better. Uh, this is just a shot of some of the different roof types. So we, on Sundance and on one of the SSRA, we did a truss over build. So I'd say check out the uh, Retrofit Canada for more details there. Air tightness is really important, obviously. It does not, <laughs> uh, 30 seconds, <laughs> <clears throat> almost there. Uh, material price jumps with higher performance tapes, higher performance WRBs. It will reduce your peak load. It is really important to test. The, car the embodied carbon is not that dependent on it. Um, but if you're shipping those materials from overseas, that obviously is going to have more. But it's a small part of your overall embodied carbon. If you have to redo details, that uh, is going to really increase your, your costs. And it's going to improve your resilience if you can uh, reduce your air leaks. Mechanical systems, I say my time is up. 
<laughs> inflection point is heat pumps add cooling. If you're doing heat pumps, you've got to remember to compare apples to apples. We're not just talking about a furnace to a heat pump. You're talking about a furnace and an air conditioner to a heat pump. So how these systems work together is critical. So if you, again, if you increase your performance, it's going to reduce your peak loads, your energy use, your op costs will depend on your fuel choice. So electricity versus gas. It will increase your embodied carbon, and they do have a high install cost. But if you have a higher performance system, it can improve your resiliency. So electrical panel replacement versus a service upgrade. So if you can keep it under 100 amps overall, then your overall system is going to have less peak loads on the, uh, the grid in general. If you increase the service size, that's going to handle and allow higher peak energy draw. Um, it will also increase your embodied carbon because overall infrastructure has to upgrade to handle that. And demand charges is something that we are starting to see with multifamily buildings. This is a really important thing we need to pay attention to as we're electrifying buildings. The construction process, last thing I'll talk about. So, are the processes you're doing, are they specialized knowledge or are they specialized processes? And these can have good and bad both ways. So do you, can you design a DER that uses a standard construction process, but is applied with some intelligence overall and still achieve the same end goals? So there's a p potential reduction in loads, you know, reduced embodied carbon. So if your crew understands this, you can, everybody knows how to reach the same end goals. I'm going to have to skip through this. So the sweet spot that I found. Hydrovac the foundation, add on at least R20 G GPS foam. Uh, I would strip the old siding and stucco. I would look for a local, locally made triple pane vinyl casement window with factory jam extensions. Um, WRB sealed to the foundation on the original sheeting. Uh, we found using this we can hit uh, 0.6 without too much issue. I would do five inches of R21 Roxol. This is a new product that's available, Roxol Comfort Board. Um, you don't need any special panels, but it gets you sort of good enough. Rain screen with composite siding, something like Ecoside or LP Smart Side has a low embodied carbon, helps to offset some of that Roxol. Two inch spray foam air seal in the attic, plus R60 blow in on top uh, of the original attic. Uh, and that's sort of, it basically gets you good enough. That should get you a design heat load on a 1,200 square foot bungalow under 7 kilowatts. And that is enough to do 100 amp service. So with that, you can put in uh, something like a TOSO 4 ton air source heat pump with no backup. Those have data down to minus 30. And with a design heat load that low, you, your building is going to stay warm even if it doesn't, uh, even if something's going wrong with that heat pump. Drain water heat recovery, heat pump water tank, uh, a good ERV, a heat pump clothes dryer, and that should work on a 100 amp service and a minimal specialized install process. So hopefully all those items together, that's what I would like to see in a retrofit. Um, I think those would be good enough. That is very close to net zero, so that should, uh, should get you there. Sorry for going over. Thanks, folks. <laughs>